All right. Friday, October 4th, day two of this unit, function analysis. Sounds fancy. <laughs> analyzing functions. Um, that's sort of the whole unit is analyzing functions. Um, and like big picture, the, an the question we want to answer is, what does f prime and f double prime tell us about the graph? Like that's that's the entire unit uh, question right there. What does f prime and f double prime <coughs> excuse me tell us about the graph? <coughs> so we'll spend a couple days talking about what f prime tells us because it tells us a couple things. <coughs> we'll spend a couple days talking about f double prime. What does that tell us? And then we'll review and then we'll test. So like this is the, this isn't just the question for today. This is the question for the whole unit. <coughs> what does f prime and f double prime tell us about the graph? We I should have said this yesterday because we started answering this question within the f prime answer is MVT. That's where MVT sort of falls. Is what is it's related to f prime. Now we're going to look more specifically at what does f prime tell us about the graph. You might already know because there's another word for derivative that we've used. What, what word for derivative is almost the same thing? Starts with an S. Slope. You need to have those two things tied together in your brain. Derivative, slope, slope, derivative. Those go together. Okay, always read a graph like you read a book, right? Left to right. So when I ask, does the function go from positive to negative, what we're really saying is um, if x is increasing going to the right, does the y value change from positive to negative? So left to right, that's sort of understood from here on out. You read a book, or you read a graph like you read a book from left to right. Uh, and the only, I guess, confusing time would be if the graph looks like, let's say we had a graph that looked like this. Is that graph increasing or decreasing? What's that? You said it. Increasing. Oops. Increasing. As you read it left to right, what's the graph doing? Increasing. increasing. So that's the one that throws people off, especially if it stops, because you're like, oh, look, we'll start here and go down. Well, I guess, but if you read it from left to right, that is an increasing graph. No, the, the rest of it makes sense. It's just one that looks like that. Feels, feels backwards. All right, we're only consider the domain of a given function, um, whether we are given the function's equation, the graph, a table, whatever. Um, our answer should only include values that are in the domain. That, that should make sense. Like you shouldn't be given an answer that's not in the interval. Uh, we kind of touched on that on MVT. MVT comes with an interval. Don't give me an answer that's outside of that interval. Graph below is assumed to continue forever in both directions because there are no designated points at its ends. This actually came up in my Facebook group the other day. Uh, one of the new teachers was like, do I assume this goes on forever or not? And the main guy was like, yes, you assume it goes on forever. If they wanted it to end, they'd put a point there to sort of I indicate that like, that's it, we're done. Uh, but the arrows are implied. It's rare that that matters, but just so you know. Okay, increasing and decreasing intervals visually. Again, read the graph from left to right. As x moves to the right, if the function is going up, the function is said to be, well, which one of those words do you think would mean going up as we move left to right? Increasing. As x moves to the right, if the function is going down, the function is said to be decreasing. Okay, we left blanks in here because we don't know what color highlighters you have. So you get to pick. So you'll need two different colors of highlighters. So maybe share with somebody around you if you've only got one or don't have any. Um, actually, I have, a, I have a few I could toss out. Yes. Anybody else? Oh, Ben, I'm going to go long distance here. 
Yes, beautiful. Um, so hopefully that's enough spread out among you. Uh, oh, I got one more I could share. Somebody else? Justin? Uh, Luke's trying, but I'm going to go high on you. you. You got the height. There we go. So pick a color. It doesn't matter which color you pick. Um, I'm going to just go yellow for the first one because that's just the one I grabbed. And then I'm going to highlight all the places where the graph is increasing. So increasing. So as I move left to right, where am I going up? <coughs> yellow, well, so the first one, first color you pick, highlight all the increasing uh, intervals. That's not the only one, but that's the first one to get you started. Highlight the increasing intervals. Caden, you're, you're scared to commit? <laughs> He's waiting for me? No, there you go. That's right. Increasing. 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 And then with a different color, trade with somebody if you need to. what color that is. I guess that's blue. Yeah. Although up here it looks periwinkle. I'm just going to call it blue. <laughs> yeah, that orange one needs to Again, left to right, going up is increasing, coming down is decreasing. Before you throw them back at me, I don't think we need any more highlighters. So one at a time, return them. Look at that. One-handed grab. Were you all at the game last night? Yeah. You yeah. see that one-handed grab? That, that, yeah, that, that was amazing. That play was called back, but that was amazing. Okay. Increasing, decreasing. Pretty simple, right? You're left to right going up, left to right going down. Just make sure you're you're reading left to right. Okay, relative extrema. <laughs> relative extrema sounds fancy. There is an interval, a neighborhood, around the point a comma f of a. So we're looking at this that first uh, top of the mountain there, at which f of a is the largest value of f. That makes f have a relative maximum. Relative maximum. <coughs> Meaning relative to his neighbors. A relative maximum is the, the top of a hill. It may not be the biggest hill on the graph, but it's the top of a hill. So it's a relative maximum. And that value, so the y value is f of a. So the, the value is f of a, and it's at x equals a. That's kind of important because you have to read the questions carefully because it might say, what is the maximum? That would be the y value. Or it might say, where is the maximum? So the what is the y value, the where is the x value. Uh, if, it, what's, if it's a where, it'll usually say where or what is the x value of the maximum. But if it just says what's the maximum, make sure you give the y value. Another phrase for relative maximum is one that maybe makes more sense. That's local maximum. Like in his local neighborhood, in his area, f of a is at the top of a hill. There is an interval around b comma f of b at which f of b is the smallest value of f. That makes f have a, what do you think goes in this blank? Relative minimum. Relative minimum. Relative to its neighbors. It doesn't mean it's the lowest value. It just means it's a value. It's one of the, the bottoms. 
And same thing. The value of the minimum is f of b. That's the what. The where is where it happens at x equals b. Another phrase would be the local minimum. According to this definition, look at point C. Um, what is, or no, the question is, is point C a relative minimum? What do you think? Yes, it's at the bottom. It's, uh, it's the lowest point in its neighborhood. Right? It's not the lowest point overall. So it's not the global minimum, that's the other word we would use, or the overall minimum. But in his neighborhood, he's got the lowest point. So yes, that point is a relative minimum. Because relative to his neighbors, there's nobody lower than he is. And this may be why some of you were shaking your head no. So can a cusp be a relative max or min? Yes. So a max might be the top of a hill, or it might be the top of a mountain. But either one is a relative max. Relative extrema, extrema just includes both maxes and mins. And extrema would be the plural of extremum. <coughs> so a little bit of vocabulary here. So relative mins are the local minimums, relative max, local max. Relative extrema is just an easy way to say maxes and mids. All right, critical numbers. Consider the graph shown on the interval A to B. Um, you might notice this one has end points, so we're not drawing arrows or even thinking about arrows as we're, we're limited to A to B. How many relative maximums does F have? So how many tops of hills are there between A and B? One, two, three, four. Four tops of hills, four hills, four mountains. So you tell me how many relative minimums are on that interval? Two, three, four, five. Yep, five. Really complicated stuff here. Counting the hills, counting the valleys. Good work. Um, okay, now let's turn this, turn this into calculus a little bit. What can you say about the derivative of f at each of the relative extremums? What can you say about the derivative, the slope? Um, zero is one answer. Yep, so zero or doesn't exist. Oops, put that where you can see it. So every relative max or min has a derivative of zero or doesn't exist. Um, remember that the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. That's why I was drawing these little tangent line pieces to see that our slope was zero. At each location of a relative extrema, f prime is either zero or undefined. And because those numbers are important to our graph, if we're talking about learning and analyzing about a graph, we call those critical numbers. Critical numbers of a function are all values of x at which f prime equals zero or f prime is undefined. These are all the candidates, so like possibilities for relative extrema. Um, we do need to be careful. This is a bit of a squares and rectangles thing. All relative extrema are critical numbers, but not all critical numbers are relative extrema. 
you could have a critical number that's not a relative extrema. So you could have a, a sharp point that's not a max or a min. So like right there, that's, that's a critical number, but it's not a max or a min. Uh, it works for zero as well. Like if you have a graph that levels off but then keeps going up, derivative is zero, but it's not a max or a min. So critical numbers are sort of the pool from which we can get our relative extrema, but every critical number is not a relative <coughs> extrema. And why this is important is we can find the relative extremas fairly easily with calculus, and then we have to do a little bit more work to figure out if they're a relative extrema or not, like if we have an equation. You can find critical numbers from an equation pretty easily. Relative extrema, if you look at a graph, it's super easy to find those. But if you're looking at an equation, uh, you're probably looking at that thinking, I don't know what that graph looks like. So I couldn't tell you what its relative extrema are. But I can find all the critical numbers because that's where f prime is 0 or f prime is d and e. So let's take a derivative and then we'll figure out where it's 0 or undefined. So this looks like quotient rule, derivative of the top, derivative of the bottom of the same, that's kind of nice. So my overall derivative, gf has to come first, 2x times x squared minus 9 minus 2x times x squared all over x squared minus 9 um, let's see. So the critical numbers are where the... Well, you know what? Let's clean up the top first. Um, 2x squared... Or excuse me, 2x cubed minus 2x cubed is going to go away. So I think I'm going to be left with just negative 18x. Sort of two categories of critical numbers. There's f prime equals zero and f prime undefined. What would make my fraction zero? This gets back to the thing that people get confused with about fractions. What makes a fraction zero? The top or the bottom or both? The top. What makes a fraction undefined? Zero in the bottom. So top equals 0, negative 18x equals 0. So x equals 0 is a critical number because it makes the derivative zero. <coughs> Undefined would be if the bottom is 0. So x squared minus 9 squared equals 0. Uh, can you tell by looking what values of x would make that 0? plus or minus 3. So you could factor it, or you could square root both sides, but eventually you're going to get plus or minus 3. So our critical numbers are, are both the places where the derivative is 0 and where it's undefined. So that means there might be a relative extrema at 0 and plus or minus 3. But we don't really know yet, and we don't know how to find that out yet. That's, that's for later. Right now, this is critical. Number two, find all the critical numbers. So f prime equals 0, or f prime undefined. h of x equals e to the x sine of x on 0 to 2 pi. OK, so product rule. Usually don't write out the product rule. I'll just do first times derivative of the second plus second times derivative of the first. That one always feels weird because e to the x, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So I want to know where that's zero. <coughs> uh, 
And I want to know where it's undefined. This looks weird. Undefined equals... That's not really good math right there. But we want to know where it's undefined. The undefined one's easier because e to the x is always defined, sine of x is always defined, cosine is always defined. And so any combination of defined functions, multiply, add, whatever, like that, it's always defined. Always works. So no critical points from that part of the problem. This part of the problem, let's see. Uh, e to the x equals 0 or cosine x plus sine x equals 0. I'm doing that in algebra 2 right now. Uh, not quite that difficult, but when you factor and set each of the factors equal to 0, that's what I'm doing here. Let's see, e to the x looks something like that. So that's, that's never equal to 0. Cosine x plus sine x equals 0. I think I'm going to move the sine x over this. So cosine x equals sine x, but I need their signs to be different. Can you think about the unit circle? What values, what angles have the same like value, but off by a sign? and 7 pi over 4. Because they're both root 2 over 2, and in the second and fourth quadrant, they have different signs. So there's my critical numbers for that graph. And so those, those are definitely critical numbers, which means they might be relative extrema. Okay, we're not worried about relative extrema yet, but... One step at a time. All right, last page for today. Increasing and decreasing intervals. We kind of talked about, not kind of, we did talk about increasing and decreasing intervals. Um, same picture. Here's a technical definition that I don't know that you're ever going to have to remember or use or know. So I'll read through it once. We'll see if we can make sense of it. But you're not, that, there's not a star next to this. We'll just put it that way. A function f is increasing on an interval if f of b is greater than f of a for b is greater than a. So that means as I'm moving to the right, if b is bigger than a, then the y value is getting bigger as well where a and b are on the interval. If f of b is greater than f of a for all b greater than a, this is a lot of, of words here, strictly increasing means it never levels off. There's never, um, there's never a spot where the derivative is zero. It's always increasing. Thank you. Same thing for decreasing. You know what decreasing means. Strictly decreasing means it never levels off. So what that would look like, that function is not strictly increasing because of a spot like right there. So that strictly means it makes it a little stricter on what it means to be increasing. That function is increasing. <coughs> But it's not strictly increasing because there's a spot where it, it levels off. <coughs> that stuff rarely matters. What matters a lot is these next couple of boxes. Triple highlighted, bastard, whatever. What would you say about the derivative when f is increasing? So left to right, we're increasing. If the function is increasing, what would you say about the derivative? F prime. What does F prime tell you about the graph? Slope. What would you say about the slope of a graph that's increasing? It's positive. 
f prime is positive, the graph of f is increasing. That makes sense, because f prime is the slope. And if the slope is positive, we're going up. What can you say about the derivative of f when f is decreasing? Well, f prime is negative. Derivative is slope, slope is derivative. You make that connection, you're, you're good for most of the first semester of calculus. Um, so here's how we determine increasing and decreasing intervals. F is increasing if F prime is greater than zero. That's kind of what we just said. If F prime is positive, then we're increasing. F prime is negative, then we're decreasing. This next thing is a little bit weird. It should be noted that a function can be increasing or decreasing even where the derivative is undefined. For example, here's the cube root of x. So right there, that slope is undefined. We talked about this a little bit. Vertical tangent lines have an undefined slope, which means their derivative is undefined. But that's still an increasing function. So just got to be a little careful about these. All right. On what intervals, if any, is this function decreasing? Justify your answer. Okay. I like to justify my answer first because that tells me what I'm looking for. So how do I know if a function is decreasing? What would tell me that it's decreasing? F prime is negative. So my justification is going to be F prime is negative. So I get a point or two already. And I haven't really even worked the problem yet. But I've justified, so I know what I'm looking for. So let's take a derivative and figure out where it's negative. So G prime is negative 9x squared plus 6x. Well, that doesn't really help me with where it's negative. Any idea on what I could do to start to figure out where it's negative? This a bunch this semester. Let's set it equal to zero. Uh, I'm going to factor out a negative 3x. <coughs> We'll set our factors equal to zero. So either x is zero or x is two thirds. I still haven't figured out where it's negative. I figured out where it's zero. We're going to put a number line, and we're going to put our zeros on the number line. Zero and two thirds. And then I'm going to check points in between or in each of those intervals. So I'm going to check um, negative 1. And I'll check, oh, uh, kind of yuck, but I need a number between 0 and 2 thirds. One third. One third. I mean, there's an infinite number of choices, but 1 third would be the best choice. And something bigger <coughs> than 2 thirds? One. 1. You can pick anything bigger than 2 thirds. So you can pick. 12 or 483, but 1 would probably be the best pick. And let's plug that into g prime and see what happens. So if I plug in negative uh, 1, let's see, that would get me positive times, and I only care about signs, so I don't really even need the value here. Um, negative 3 minus 2 is negative. So g prime would be negative. If g prime is negative, what does that tell me about the function? It's decreasing. So g prime is negative means we're decreasing. I don't need the picture of the arrow. What I really need is g prime is negative, but I like making that connection while we're here. All right, if I plug in one third, and I'm I'm plugging into the the factored form because I feel like that's the easier way to go. Negative 3 times 1 third would be negative. 3 times a third 
minus 2, 3 times the third is 1, 1 minus 2 is negative. So that means g prime is positive. That means g is increasing. And then if I plug in 1, I get negative 3 times 1. So that's negative. So g is decreasing. Okay. I think I know my answer. I haven't really answered the question, though. On what intervals is g decreasing? So g decreases from negative infinity up to 0, and from 2 thirds to infinity, because g prime is negative. So when you're looking for positives or negatives, you can't you don't really find them directly. You find the zeros first and then you test the intervals. So yeah. Zeros and intervals. Number two, same type question. On what intervals is this thing increasing? So now I'll be looking for where it's positive. Where F, where Y prime is positive. I'm going to change that to a power rather than a square root. Uh, it's been a while since we did that, but that was on that test on Tuesday. Um, that very last question said that dh dt was the square root of h. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And I was impressed. Almost all of you changed it to h to the 1 half and then, and then took a derivative. So you can't take a derivative of a square root or cube root. you got to make it a power. So dy dx, one third, three minus x to the negative two thirds. <coughs> um, in fact, this is sort of mirroring that problem because you get a negative exponent, which means let's put it in the denominator. I forgot something. Same thing that some of you forgot on that problem. What did I forget? Where's the times negative 1 coming from? The chain rule. So the derivative of this thing would be negative 1. Um, quite a few of you forgot the chain rule on that h problem. So you did the derivative of h right, but you forgot to attach dh dt on the end of it. OK, so what is going to make this 0 or undefined? Like what's my critical number going to be? What value of x would make this thing 0 or undefined? 3. And it kind of doesn't matter if you know if it's 0 or undefined. It's undefined, but. Either way, it's a critical number. So x equals 3 is the only thing I'm worried about. This is kind of nice. It means I only have two intervals to check. So I need a number less than 3 to check. OK. I heard negative 1, 0, 2. All of those are fine. Um, I'm looking where I'm going to plug it in. And I 0 is normally a great choice. But to take a cube root, I think maybe plugging in two would be good because then I would get I would get one. That would be easy. How about a number bigger than three? I got four, five, twelve, one million. But let's do four. Sometimes I mean I'm joking about a million, but sometimes depending on the problem, a million is easy to plug in because it's easy to see what happens if you plug in a million. Like it's easy to tell that it's positive or negative. That's maybe not so much here, so let's just go with 4. All right, if I plug in 2, I plug it into y prime, so plug it into this guy. Let's 
be that would be negative 1 over 3 times <coughs> 1 to the 2 thirds again I don't really care about the values I only care about the sign that's going to be negative equals negative so y is decreasing I plug in 4, negative 1 over 3, 3 minus 4 to the 2 thirds. I've got to be a little bit more careful on this one. 3 minus 4 is negative 1. The top number is the power, the bottom number is the root. <coughs> what happens when I square negative 1? I get a positive 1 and then I cube root it. I'm still at a positive 1. So all of this equals negative. Again, we're not, we don't really care about the values. We care about the signs. So that means y is decreasing. So now let's make sure we answer the right question. All, we got a lot of good work there. On what intervals is the function increasing? <laughs> Never. Bit of a trick question there. Um, and I guess we should say y prime is always negative. Okay. Today's assignment is 1 through 8 on worksheet 2, which you don't have, but I'm about to give you.